For the first time since the revolution in 1979, an Iranian head of state has sent a letter of congratulations to an incoming U.S. president. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's letter seemed to warn that unspecified opportunities won't last forever, whatever that meant. Iran continues to deny evidence its nuclear program has military aspirations, but it is a regime that is on the record as wanting to wipe out the state of Israel. Human Majd was born in Tehran, grew up in the U.S., and had a flourishing career as a record industry executive, among other things. He goes back to Iran a lot. His rather picaresque and wild book about the place is called The Ayatollah Begs to Differ, The Paradox of Modern Iran. Well, Mr. Majd, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, this is a key thing. Mm -hmm. Obama gets elected. The letter mm -hmm. comes from Ahmadinejad mm -hmm. to Obama. Congratulations. And he talks about some unspecified opportunities mm -hmm. that won't last forever. What do you make of that? I think he's talking about the opportunity for President Obama to follow through on his campaign pledge, his early campaign pledges, which was to talk to Iran, negotiate with Iran without preconditions. This has been the sticking point for Iran from day one. I was in Tehran when Ahmadinejad gave a speech in 2007 to a huge crowd. Um, and uh, he said, you know, the Americans say, stop enriching uranium and then we'll come and talk to you. And what we say to them is, if we stop enriching uranium, what is there to talk about? It is possible that Iran and the United States, Iran and the West, could be on the verge, I don't know exactly when, of some kind of confrontation. I'm talking about missiles flying. That's possible, I guess, yes. Well, just reading in recent days that, in fact, the, it is calculated the Iranians now have enough enriched uranium to make a bomb. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to actually go and build the bomb. I think the main issue for Americans, and certainly for the, the new government in the United States, which comes into office in January, is how do we persuade Iran to not take that step? We can't take the knowledge away from them anymore. Um, how do we persuade them? The way we persuaded South Africa, the way we, we keep persuading Brazil and Japan and other countries that have the capability to build a bomb in a long weekend if they wanted to, that they don't need to do that. Well, to choose the right path forward, mm -hmm. so we don't end up there, we have to really understand who we're dealing with. Yes. Now, Human, you've helped with a little bit of that. How is it that a cool guy like you ended up translating for the president of Iran when the president of Iran gave the big speech at the United Nations? Uh, yeah, I've done that a number of times for the president you're of Iran. You were the actual guy if I'm you were just, listening yes. on the headset. It was yes. you. Yeah, it's me. Um, I had a close relationship, but still have a close relationship with former President Khatami. And when Khatami was here after he was president in 2006, he asked me to accompany him as an advisor, as a, as a consultant on his trip in America, on his um, various stops in America. And out of the blue, they said, well, you know, you, your English is better than anyone else's around here. Could you just be the translator? I said, I'm not a professional interpreter. I don't, I'm, I'll try. And so um, I did. And then the Iranian government obviously heard it and saw it, and so they asked me to do the same thing for President Ahmadinejad, and I said, okay, I, I will, I'll be happy to. Unpaid, um, I don't want to be an employee of the uh, Iranian government, and I said, as long as I can write about it. As a journalist, as a writer, um, nothing is off the record, and they said, that's fine. Do the Iranian people understand that the president who represents them in the public sphere, mm -hmm. Ahmadinejad, mm -hmm. I mean, he hasn't exactly been all sweetness and light. He, his exactly. rhetoric is very tough. Uh, tough. Yes. That's one way to put it. The rhetoric that he uses with respect to Israel is very inflammatory. Well, it's crazy inflammatory, some of Ahmadinejad's uh, rhetoric. The famous line about uh, Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth. Yes. Uh, that that is stuck in people's minds. That has stuck in people's minds, and unfortunately it was not a good translation of what he said in Farsi. He actually just repeated, he was quoting um, uh, a speech by Ayatollah Khomeini, who said, and his exact words were, the regime that occupies Jerusalem will one day vanish from the pages of time. The main point, as far as Iranians were concerned, was the regime that occupies Jerusalem, which means the regime, the government of Israel. But isn't this sort of playing with fire? Because, yes, it does accrue political benefits within Iran yes, to embrace the, the extreme interpretation of that line. But it has a cost. Mm -hmm. it, it, it almost seems counterproductive. Well, as far as they're concerned, the cost was it was worth it. Because at that, po at that point, they didn't think either the United States or Israel was going to go to war over Iran, with Iran over those words. And their calculation was right in this case. They had, neither Israel nor the United States has gone to war. But Iranians like to stake out a position. 
Um, they like to stake out, and when I say the Iranians, the Iranian government in this case likes to stake out a position, likes to stake out a position that it is a superpower in the region, it should be reckoned with, it should be a, viewed as a legitimate government, it should be viewed with respect. I've just seen the statistic that it's a very young population. Mm-hmm. About half the population is under about 25 or 26 years old. Yes. Is it something that's really apparent? And if so, what does it, what does it mean to Iran? It's very apparent, and I think the government's very well aware of it, and is, that's one of the reasons I think the government isn't as strict um, with social behavior as they would like to be sometimes. But what does that say to you? And there is an implication for the U.S. relationship with mm-hmm. Iran. What does it say to you? What it says to me is the Iranian people want more freedom than they have. They'll take whatever freedoms they can. But it says to me that the Iranian government is smart enough not to you know, really annoy a population of young people to the point where they may become revolutionary. It also means that it's an opportunity for the United States because these young people all watch American television. They all have satellite dishes. They all all are on the Internet. What's really interesting in terms of um, the administration of George Bush and Iran is George Bush has been very, he's tried to make it very clear on numerous occasions that, you know, he has a problem with the government of Iran. You, you know, the people of Iran, we love them. And he says then that I want to talk directly to the Iranian people. So he goes on Voice of America television, which is run by the U.S. government. But it's considered by even, even young people in Iran as a propaganda device of the U.S. government. President Bush, if he had wanted to talk to the Iranian people, to these young people who would actually be quite receptive to what he has to say, all he had to do was go on Iranian television. Human, from your travels in Iran, how are U.S.-sponsored sanctions playing out in the lives of people? Really it, anger people? How, is it something that is front and center? The problem with the sanctions, what's happened with the sanctions, is America's put a tremendous amount of pressure on foreign banks. Um, that are not American banks that normally would have done a lot of business with Iran, and they don't anymore. Letters of credit for businesses are impossible to get. Um, Wiring money through the system, the world financial system, is very difficult for Iran right now. I mean, some people are blaming the Ahmadinejad government for these sanctions, but they believe that his rhetoric that you were talking about earlier has caused, has been able, has given the United States an excuse to get the support from the world to impose these sanctions on Iran, and it has affected the people. So maybe it's causing pressure to it not is. speak in those ways. It is, and that's why I think you actually see his rhetoric has been toned down a little bit. Not so much at the UN. He, does, he did call Israel a cesspool again this year at the, at the UN, which wasn't helpful. But, um, he, he, but generally speaking, I mean, him sending a congratulatory note to President-elect Obama, it's unheard of. No Iranian leader has done that in 30 years. The key to any kind of dialogue mm-hmm. at whatever level is finding areas of mutual exactly. interest. And there are some, you think? There are plenty. There are many, many areas of mutual interest. Afghanistan, Iraq are two areas of mutual interest. Iran is absolutely the mortal enemy of the Taliban and do not want to see the Taliban back in power in Afghanistan under any circumstances, which is, again, our, our goal in Afghanistan as well, to not allow the Taliban to come back into power, take over the country. They're mortal enemies of al-Qaeda. Nobody wants al-Qaeda vanquished as much as Iran does, other than the United States. That comes as a shock to some Americans, just when yes. you say that. What, they say? Yes, well, you know, let's remember, al-Qaeda has called the Shiites worse than the Jews. <laughs> so, um, and Shiites can be killed by any Sunni, by any Al-Qaeda member, at will. Um, that's how much they hate the Shiites. Um, Al-Qaeda is a threat to Iran, as far as they're concerned, which is why, after 9-11, the Iran helped the United States and Afghanistan. And, and, by the way, the George Bush administration admitted and you know, was grateful for that help that they responded by putting Iran in the axis of evil after that, which was a big problem for, for Iran. But uh, at the time, there were negotiations with Iran, and Iran helped with Afghanistan. They were very happy to see the Taliban gone. So mutual interest in the region, certainly. The one area where there is a big disagreement is Israel-Palestine, where the United States supports a two-state solution. Iran supports a one-state solution at this point. Um, which Yeah, and it's a biggie. It's a biggie. But if you have mutual interest for the Gulf, Persian Gulf, um, and Afghanistan, and Iraq, obviously, and then you say, okay, let's sit down. They're willing to sit down and talk about it, but they want to be at the table. Well, Human Majd, man of two worlds, U.S. and Iran, author of The Ayatollah Begs to Differ, The Paradox of Modern Iran, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me.
One story of hope coming out of the region is that of Greg Mortensen, who's been spearheading efforts to educate tens of thousands of children, particularly girls, in remote parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Catch our web-exclusive interview with Mortensen about the current state of both his mission and